Hello and welcome to Undercommon Taste. This is a podcast where we create and discuss homebrew content for tabletop RPGs. A trap is only a trap if you don't know about it. If you know about it, it's a challenge. I'm Ian Woodworth and I'm joined by my co-host James Daly. Today we are taking a little bit of a break and talking about something on the mechanical side. We're going to be discussing traps. Uh, what are they? When to use them? Why to use them? What kinds of traps you got? All those fun little things. Yeah, I mean, traps are a classic part of D&D, obviously. But then, unless it's like a simple tripwire trap or something like that, I don't really get to see them used a lot in games. And you can do so much with these. I mean, it's limited only by the imagination, really. So we kind of wanted to go through, kind of give you some ideas of what makes up a trap, the components, when to use something, what they can be used for these can really spice up your game which would be a lot of fun right and one of the things that you really hear about when you hear about the old school games is the traps oh they used to be these huge rube goldberg was it rube Rube goldbergian yes yeah i mean they were awesome and people had entire like notebooks devoted to like one or two single traps and, you know, the term Gygaxian refers in large part to the traps that Gary Gygax would come up with for his D&D games. The Tomb of Horrors is, you know, synonymous with deadly traps. Right. And if memory serves, that was purely a Gary Gygax concoction. All of the various and sundry traps that were present within the Tomb of Horrors. That sounds correct. I'm not 100% sure, but that does sound correct. Yeah. With the Tomb of Horrors, too, you get that old, very much like the mummy feel, you know, where you had the sand traps and the scarab traps and the pitfalls and things like that. Let's tag Brandon Fraser on this one. We love the mummy, dude. Well done. (laughs) One of the greatest movies of all time. It really is. I mean, that was a solid film. I still watch it. If it's on TV, I will stop and just sit down and plop my butt down. And it's like, okay, however much time's left on this movie, I'm not doing anything. Mummy. (laughs) Yep. All right. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is what exactly is a trap? What constitutes a trap as opposed to, say, a puzzle or, you know, a simple obstacle? What makes it a trap? So, I mean, are we going with Webster's on this one or we got? (laughs) I mean, we can if you've got it pulled up, but. No, I mean, I could pull it up. So a trap should really be, in my book at least, a deterrent. It's something that someone has placed to keep people out who are not supposed to be there. It is designed to hinder the person who is trying to access what they're not supposed to, whether that is through hindering their movement, whether it's through bodily harm, whether it's through placing obstacles in their path. It serves the function of deterring intruders. Okay, I wasn't feeling you initially when you said deterrent, but as you fleshed it out, no, I can totally see deterrent. That does make sense. I would almost want to put, they can also be used as a bottleneck or a resource train. As, yeah, as that's a, what I mean by a hindrance. You know, it's there to, yeah, to okay, bog you down. It's there to consume your resources. It's there to inconvenience the person who's not supposed to be there. Yes, absolutely. Whether that is to allow the owner of the trap a chance to escape or to attack from a more advantageous position or whether it's designed to make the cost so high for the person trying to get in that they give up and leave, you know, that all depends on where it is and how you're using it. No, I can, I can totally agree with that. That, that is actually really well put. And I'm going to go ahead and plug this up at the beginning. There is a YouTube channel called master the dungeon. They have an entire playlist. I think it's something like 25 videos at this point on different types of traps. So if you are interested in traps and trap making and all the different sort of things that you can do, I strongly encourage you to go and check out their videos. They're all between like five and eight minutes long. They're very digestible. They've got fun little illustrations. It's great. See, now Ian and I are flipping rules this week because generally I'm the one that's coming up with pop culture videos. And this week I actually brought some like old school literature and was doing some deep digging today. I've got some deep cuts coming up today, (laughs) so it'll be fun. (laughs) Well, we did also both come up with sample traps that we're going to be presenting at the end. This is going to be fun because in true 
spring a trap fashion, we don't know what the other has brought to the table. So it'll be interesting. And hopefully our examples are dissimilar enough from one (laughs) another that we don't just have, you know, the same thing, the same three traps twice. We have six pitfall traps. Imagine that. (laughs) I can tell you with 100% certainty that none of mine are pitfall traps. Neither are mine. (laughs) We have zero pitfall traps. Great. This is like the, this is like backwards wordle right now. It's wonderful. Yeah. But you're talking about going back to some of the older material. There was a third party book from third edition called Traps and Treachery that I borrowed from a mutual friend of ours. And I read this thing cover to cover. And there are a few of them that really stuck with me. And one of my traps from today is actually very heavily inspired by one of the traps from that book. Okay. To the point where I think I even kept the same name for it. Oh, very nice. Okay. I'm I'm excited to see her this one. But that's going to be at the end after we get done bullshitting about what traps are and why do you... Exactly. All right, so when should we be using traps? All the fucking time. (laughs) (laughs) As a DM, I enjoy traps. I like them in my dungeon settings. You can put them towards the beginning and then kind of as you go on midway. Again, as I talked about, intersections, crossroads, bottlenecks. These are great areas for traps for your party because your party has to pass through these areas. So if you really want your party to encounter these traps, they're a lot more likely to do it at a bottleneck or a crossroad versus in a side room somewhere that they might decide to skip to go pet a bunny somewhere else. Because they will go pet a bunny. They will absolutely every time go pet the bunny, which was at one point one of my traps in in a dungeon. And I believe I've mentioned (laughs) that before. So that was the bunny itself was the trap. And that one particularly I had, it was a gray warden and it was there protecting the bunny. And my party was very much the murder hobo type of party. And it was sitting there just doing its thing. And it said, don't bother the bunny. And one of the players in true defiant fashion went up and punted the bunny. And the gray warden just lost his crap and, and just smashed the party up pretty good because punted the bunny don't touch the bunny you're fine (laughs) why couldn't you just put the bunny back in the box oh yes but not the bees well done i give you i give you an inspiration die for the nick cage quote (laughs) oh yeah so one of the things that i have trouble with sometimes is finding the proper balance of when to use traps you know how many traps to use in a dungeon because there is a correct number and it varies from dungeon to dungeon and party to party and party to party. And you have to make sure that you're varying your traps enough to where they're not like, okay, well I'm going to keep my eyes on the floor for this inevitable pit trap that you've got. Oh, there it is. Like, Keep an eye open. There's probably another one about 10 feet that way. Yeah, no. that is one thing. And that is another thing to really think about traps is you definitely want to vary your tactics. If your party's expecting them all the time, then that is definitely an issue. One thing to bring up is something I have in one of my traps that I'm, I'm kind of waiting for to unleash here on Ian is a trapped trap, which is also an issue or a thing you can do. Yeah, but I mean, there's so many different categories of traps that you can go with. You know, there's stuff from as simple as, you know, trapped locks so that if you're using something other than the key it will cause a trap to go off most commonly like a spring-loaded dart that shoots out of the lock or you know it breaks a vial and you have acid spill out and foul the lock or a poisonous cloud come out of the lock and affect the person who is sitting there with their face right in front of the lock trying to pick it right and then you've got things like we talked at great length when we were doing our episode on the kobolds and goblins about the sort of traps that kobolds are going to come up with. Kobolds are definitely going to make full use of pitfall traps. They're going to make full use of tripwires. They're going to make full use of deadfalls because especially with pit traps, they are a very light race. I mean, if you look at the numbers in Xanathar's guide, whenever you're going through the table that you can roll on to 
randomize your attributes. So you like your height and your weight and all of that. You know, a kobold is only 30, 35 pounds. Yeah, again, they're about the size and temperament of a toddler. Yeah, they're a toddler, but a little more bitey. Yeah, pretty much. And a lot more dexterous. A lot more dexterous and more intelligent because they do have full cognition at that point. So they are acting in a more or less adult fashion, more or less. <laughs> about the same amount of wisdom, though. Let's just be completely yeah, honest. That's, yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Another trap you can find a lot with kobolds and even halflings, and this was actually one I'd considered for my traps, would be a heights trap where they are so much lower that if you're running through a dark cavern going back and forth cutting in and out you know something kind of akin to the old indiana jones last crusade where there was a blade or a cutting surface that was at a certain height for them they could just run under it no big deal but a taller character is gonna be impeded by that yes or bisected as the case may be yes <laughs> <laughs> so going through when you talk about what's that right number of traps for me personally again depending on the party if there's a rogue or two in the trap i tend to bump this up because they're more likely to be able to find and disarm these but for me a trap is probably worth about half an encounter so if you're planning like four encounters in a session maybe do three and two traps or if there's a bunch of rogues maybe three and three traps so they can disarm one or two and get caught by one or two but again you're still taking that damage it's still taking them time to puzzle and figure it out because if they sit there and ponder a trap for 20 minutes ian and i have done that before in a game just fairly recently where there was a mechanism more like what's this thing do and we sat there for about 30 minutes trying to figure it out. Never did really figure out exactly what it was for. Well, well, the thing is, we <laughs> sat there and tried to figure it out, and the whole time we were trying to figure it out, it turned out that it wasn't a trap at all. Yeah. So <laughs> it was one so, of those, it was a red herring of a trap. Yeah, and that is another fun thing to do. So like I said, for me personally, a trap's about half an encounter for damage, time, the amount of resources it's going to draw from the party. It kind of gives you an idea. I don't know if Ian's got a different feel for that, but that's just Certainly what I go with. So the way I like to go with it is I go by how many sessions I expect my dungeon to take. And so my general rule is two to three traps per session, which comes out to about the same as what you're saying, James. And so if it's only going to be a short jaunt into the dungeon, if it's, you know, like three rooms, you're only going to put one trap in there because you don't want that to take the whole session to clear three rooms because right. that's boring and slow. So, you know, maybe putting a trap on the entrance to try and get in, or maybe putting a trap at the end on the loot or a trap to yeah. try and get into that last room. But that is my general rule is two to three traps per session for the dungeon. Okay. And again, that does work out about the same. And that does sound fair. So the one largest dungeon that I have created that I've actually run players through, it was designed to be a two session dungeon. And if I'm doing the mental math right, it's been a hot minute since I've looked at that map. I'm pretty sure I have five traps in there. That was the one that you played in in the all-nighter game. Okay, that, that you... was with Magnus and our and our yeah. rambling. Or yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, and James managed to completely avoid three of my traps because he had spider walking, and so he just <laughs> walked up the walls. And because I had been using pressure plates for a lot of my traps in that particular dungeon, and so he just walked up the wall and completely avoided the pressure plate. And that's a risk that you run into sometimes. And again, that is one of those things where you can take your traps and as a DM, don't ready may just throw a trap in. You can if you want to do a quick and dirty. But think about your players. Think about how they're going to do things. What motivates your players? Are they there for loot? Are they there for experience where they want to just get all the experience, whatever? Are they, like I said with my bunny, are they a murder hobo party and just overly aggressive? And so you know that you put this weak little kobold that's sitting there and limping along so they're going to go try to ambush it anyway. You can use your party's motivations, mentalities against them. And that really is what makes a good, good trap. I was reading the Book of Challenges. This was actually a third edition book that has a bunch of different riddles and traps and how to build and use traps, which was a really fun book to read. Two of the things they brought up is, one, the when and why to use traps. And when your party can outthink a trap, that is such a morale boost and they feel good about themselves. Ha, I outsmarted the dungeon master. I outsmarted the person designing this dungeon and the map and we're ahead or we're getting over things. And that always makes you feel really good. The other thing from that they brought up is what are 
the components of a trap, what makes a trap a trap, kind of like what Ian was saying. And it's three things. It's the bait, it's the danger, and it's that sense of safety that the danger is far enough away that you can escape it or it's not going to affect you. And in this case, they use like an actual mouse trap, where you've got the cheese, you've got the pressure plate that sets off the snapping bar, but that bar is set so far away from the cheese that it doesn't seem like a threat until the pressure plate goes and it snaps. And then you're like, oh, there's a trap. I really like that. Yeah, like I said, that book, I found it actually doing the research for this, and that was a great read. It's not terribly long, and it had a ton of really good ideas. If you get a chance to find it and dredge that up, that was third edition. It was called The Book of Challenges. But one of the things that I really try and do whenever I'm designing or implementing my traps is every trap should have a purpose. You don't just put a trap in because you want your party to run into it. Every trap should have a purpose. It should be there to protect an area. It should be there to deter intruders. It should be there as a protective layer for a layer. There should be a rhyme to your reasons. Yes. And the form and function of your trap should also mirror that. So you don't want to be using a very sophisticated magical trap in a tunnel full of goblins. Right. No, they are definitely going to be more of a mechanical trap. And that can lead us into what are your trap component types, you know, kind of leading in. For me, I see three brittle main types of traps as far as what you're going to make them out of or what they're going to do. You have mechanical traps, which are going to be physical traps, tripwires, pitfalls, things that have some sort of mechanism. You have biological traps, traps that are going to involve other NPCs or monsters or some living element that is part of the trap or just a purely magical trap where you go, you trigger a rune or there's maybe a magical device that's set it up and that where you kind of get a blend of the magical and mechanical both that way. And you can mix and match these elements. One of the very common old school traps that a lot of people have used is the 10 foot by 10 foot square pit that, you know, it's at the end of the hallway. There's, you know, all the loot in the bottom of this pit. And so you send someone down on a rope to go down into this pit and they drop into a gelatinous cube. Yes. So that is a very common trap that a lot of people use. It is a tried and true trap. Because it almost always works. It does. <laughs> and that's a combination of a physical pit trap and a biological gelatinous cube. There we go. And again, as Ian was saying, the type of trap you're going to set up really should reflect the maker of the trap. As much as art represents the artist trap making absolutely is an art. I will die on that hill. I don't care who you are. Oh, yes. Trap making is absolutely an art. And so if you have, you know, a bunch of goblins, you're not going to have super complex mechanical traps. You're going to have more simple traps. They're probably going to be fairly vicious. They might be made out of wood, stone, bone, a little bit of metal, where if you're on the opposite end and maybe you're dealing with like a guild of warforged wizards or maybe like a manufacturer's guild or something you're gonna have a lot of cogs and machines and these can be a lot more complex you can have something where one trap triggers and sets the second part of a trap and that's where you get the more gigaxian traps that kind of link together which can be a really nasty thing to do you saw that more in older editions and, you know, if you have something like an Artificer's Workshop, that is straight up Macaulay Culkin Home Alone. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Which I still want to do as a Christmas one-off <laughs> when we do a holiday thing. We definitely need to do a Home Alone Trap Dungeon. <laughs> yeah, that would be a ton of fun. Let's put and, that on the whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that on the whiteboard. And another thing to keep in mind with who is making this trap is why are they making this trap? Are they just trying to deter people from coming in? Are they expecting like assassins or rival wizards or some such individuals to try and come in? And so they are actually trying to eliminate the person coming in after them that's going to trip the trap. There's a lot there to try and make sure that you account for because, you know, most of your traps, at least in an urban environment, say you're going into this noble's house, you have to sneak in and steal a document from their writing desk and you want to put a trap in there. A good place to put that would be, say, in the lock on the writing desk and do it so that it's a trap that will trigger if someone tries to open it without the key if someone tries to pick the lock to unlock this writing desk yeah. you don't want to put it on something like the door into the room because 
if you put it on the door into the room, chances are you're going to end up having your servants set off this trap. Right. You're going to have to reset this trap three times a week. <laughs> and it's going to get very expensive to pay the physician's bills <laughs> or the funeral costs for all of these servants and for hiring new servants. Unless the servants know where the trap is. But at that point, that's also a good way for like, if you were trying to do like a mansion run where the mansion's actually the dungeon would be to have your party members find the servants and maybe question, interrogate, bribe. And the servants could say, there's traps here, there's traps here for these things. And that's a great way for your party to discover and find these traps as well. And if your party can find a trap or disarm a trap otherwise, that is absolutely always an XP reward of some sort. If you're using actual XP points, if you're doing milestone, then you figured out when they're going to level up anyway. But if you're doing actual like XP awards, that kind of role play should always be awarded. Yeah. My personal go-to for that, for non-combat XP is for each quote unquote encounter that they overcome. That is a non-combat encounter is sufficient XP for 5% of a level. Yeah, that works. And given that all of the XP values for reaching another level are increments of 100, so 5% actually works out as even math, regardless of your level that you're going to. Yeah, easy math. (laughs) But again, going back, you have to consider what the traps are doing. Again, are you punishing a thief? Are you deterring a thief? Those two, the amount of ouch those traps are going to have are vastly, vastly different. Are you trying to give someone a very gentle but firm slap on the wrist, turn them around and point them saying, go away? Are you trying to catch the person who's trying to break in and hold them there till the authorities show up? That's another way to do it. Or sometimes a trap is purely just an alarm. And again, an alarm could summon more guards and that becomes part of a biological trap. It gives someone who's there, like if you had the master of like a wizard's tower or a dungeon or a lair of some sort, either time to arm and prep or to just flat out escape if they hear you coming in. If you go and they have a bunch of cans and you stomp through them and knock them down as you're going through the dark cavern and they make a bunch of noise, then poof, your target can go and run off and escape through a spider hole or something like that. So a trap does not always have to damage the party. It's something that in some way inconveniences or hinders. Yes. All right. Do you have anything more to talk about on traps in general? No, I think that covers generally what they do. Again, they can be as simple or as complex as you like. Just kind of rounding out, hitting some high points. Simple or complex, your trap should fit a purpose. You have to decide what that purpose is. They should fit the personality, temperament, and abilities of the trap makers. And if you can get those three main points in when you build or create your traps, that adds a lot of flavor and it makes the game more immersive. And you can kind of do that where you feel like you're actually in the game. Consider, again, where you're putting your trap. You don't want them out of the way places. You do want them at bottlenecks, at intersections, places where your party is going to be highly likely to pass through, guarding treasure, guarding doors or passages you don't necessarily want people to go through. That gives you a basic blueprint of when and where to trap. Yeah, and just real quick, talking about the abilities of the individuals setting this trap. You can have a very complex trap in, say, a goblin's lair. That is a world-building decision to show that the goblins have moved in to an abandoned location that already had these in place, that these were established by someone else, and that Typically, if these traps are still intact, there's unexplored elements beyond. That is a great piece of world building, yes. So you can have things like you give them the warning that there's a trap there by saying, yeah, there is a bisected goblin corpse laying in this doorway. Yeah. And so you know that there is a trap there and that gives them that wink, wink, nudge, nudge, look for a trap prompt so they can go and make that investigation check to see if they can find a trap, see if they can find what triggers the trap, see if the trap, you know, automatically resets or if it's a one and done thing. And so it's already been set off. These are all things that you can add into your game. That is what we call a very generous and gentle DM tip to the party. 
And a world building thing that Ian mentioned that I should have brought up too is the complexity of the trap in any area will absolutely reflect how long people have been there or whoever set up the trap has been there. Obviously, if goblins have been in this cave for generations, they are going to have time to build more sound complex traps versus if they've just moved in, then they're going to have very simple traps set up because that's all there's been time to set up. Absolutely. Okay. So, so what's your first trap? I, I am very curious. You want me to go first? Yeah, I'll let you go ahead and go first on this one. All right. So the general premise that we had was we're going to come up with three traps, one each for an underground location, a wilderness location, and a mage's tower. And I think talking beforehand, both of us came up with one each of a mechanical, a biological, and a magical trap. And we just kind of did that on our own. So again, sometimes we think alike. <laughs> Yeah, we have not consulted at all on these beforehand. So the first one that I have is called Release the Hounds. Okay. So while traveling through an underground complex, you come across a slightly flooded passage. The floor, which is hard flat stone, is covered with a layer of sediment about an inch thick and further covered by about two inches of standing water. Hiding beneath the silt and muck is a hidden pressure plate, which, when depressed, causes a barricade to drop behind the party and opens a number of hidden doors, causing monsters to spill out. I like it. This is actually extremely similar to what I came up with. This is actually the one that I created that you evaded with your spider climb. Oh, okay. Yes, you had several of those. You had one that was really nasty too, if I recall, that did a raise dead, if I recall. Um, No, it wasn't that it did a raise dead. It was when you stepped on the pressure plate, the doors to the cells with all the skeletons and zombies in them open. Gotcha. That's what it was. And let them all out. Now, that was very similar to one. I almost stole this one, but I didn't want to steal something outright. Well, I did kind of steal one outright. I didn't want to steal two outright. (laughs) That was a really, really nasty. But basically, as your party goes through a dungeon or a room, it kills a bunch of low-level mobs. As you exit the room, it triggers a trap of raised dead. So all the monsters you kill resurrect and attack you again from behind, which I was just like, oh, that is glorious. I need to save that one. (laughs) Yeah, that's great for like a lich's lair. Oh, absolutely. So this particular one is great for like inhabited caves and tunnels, underground cult layers, or subterranean ruins. It is ideal for a kobold layer because pressure plates are great for kobolds because kobolds are lightweight and they can run across a pressure plate without setting it off. Whereas your human fighter, he's already 180 pounds and then he's wearing 60 pounds of armor and carrying all of his gear. He's clumping along. He's clomp clomping along and he's going to set this thing off. So this particular trap, you can't find the pressure plate off of just a basic perception check because it's underneath the mud and muck. But what you can find is all of the various doors and portals and stuff on the sides that will open when a trap goes off. So you're not going to be able to find the trigger mechanism. You're going to find the trap itself is the way that I've got this set up. So a DC 15 perception check, you notice the trap. If you get at least an 18, you'll also notice the barricade that is going to drop down behind you. You can make that lower depending on whether you want this to be a barricade as in like a portcullis. If you want it like a portcullis door that drops down, that's going to be very obvious. Whereas something like just a precariously perched boulder that's going to fall off of a shelf because it's got something behind it that's going to give it a shove might not be as obvious. Okay. Yeah, no, I like that. And so once you have noticed that the trap is there, then it's an investigation check to swirl through the mud and muck to find that pressure plate. You can use something like a 10-foot pole to skim around under the slurry to try and find it without applying enough pressure to set it off. Uh, You could use something like the shape water cantrip to sort of swirl the water around to disturb the silt and push it away. Or if you wanted to, because shape water allows you to freeze water, you could just use shape water to freeze the entire, all of the water in the hallway. And then you just walk across the ice. And you just make a plank. Yeah, that would work. And then you just avoid the trap entirely. Or you can just spider walk. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or you can just spider walk up the walls like some bastard I know and completely. <laughs> Magnus does what he does. <laughs> he sure does. And then it's a DC 15 dex check or thieves tools or masonry tools or whatever appropriate 
tools you have if you have proficiency to jam the pressure plate and disable the trap. Okay, I like it. Like I said, mine wound up being really similar. I didn't name mine because, as I've said many times on and off air, I suck at naming things until I'm awesome. It's weird. I either roll a 1 or a 20, and I far more often roll 1s. But, again, my dungeon trap is going to be largely for something underground, like if there was an underground temple or something where things have been more set up, less cave but more underground feature, dwarven ruins, something along those lines. Again, it's a simple pressure plate trap because they're easy, they're go-to, you can really do them. DC, depending on what the party level would be, I'd leave this up to the DM's discretion. But upon stepping on the pressure plate, it releases a trap door from above. People don't look up. Party members very, very rarely look up. They always look down, they look at walls, they never look up. Upon stepping on, it drops 1d6 giant wolf spiders. So I was kind of going for that, what would be creepier in a dark room you're going through and you feel like the spider's crawling down your back or something like that. If you can throw a bunch of gummy spiders on the table, particularly if you have several people that are extremely arachnophobic, that's always kind of a fun thing to do. Do, don't, do not put... <laughs> spiders on the table if you have people who are tremendously arachnophobic well, not tremendously let's go moderately arachnophobic but yeah but don't, you know, don't do that can... do not traumatize your players for the sake of the game don't traumatize your players but if you have something that can give them a touch of the willies or a brief shiver Again, for me, that is atmosphere. I do enjoy kind of that. I mean, of the things, spiders are kind of a fun thing. Or clowns. Spiders or clowns are great to just have pop up randomly in your dungeons. Why not? <laughs> Again, you can find the wolf spiders, if I recall, they're DC one quarter. So they're not super beefy for the party to fight, but they do have a good venom bite. That's a DC 11 constitution saving throw. They take 2d6 poison damage on a fail or half as much on a save. If the poison damage reduces the target to zero hit points, the target is stable but poisoned for one hour. Even after regaining hit points, the target will still be paralyzed while poisoned in this way. So again, this can stop the party, can hinder the party. Spiders, for me, are kind of a fun atmospheric thing if you kind of want to give people that kind of creepy vibe. It's something unexpected, but it's not going to straight hammer the party, even if they're lower level. It's going to impede them and definitely make them more cautious going through. Right. And now with my trap, depending on where you're putting it, what you're going to want to have release whenever you do this error things that can be locked away indefinitely and be self-sufficient so things like swarms of insects or mindless undead so you know you open it up and a bunch of zombies fall out yeah because if they're sitting there for 20 years they're not going to (laughs) mind yeah a rush of water filled with aquatic creatures like swarms of quippers which are these little like piranhas so a door drops off on either end sealing this room and the trap door is open and now you're standing in two feet of water that's full of piranhas fun i hope you don't like toads (laughs) <laughs> elemental creatures so like methods or water weirds i can just imagine you open up these doors and like half a dozen mud methods flop out oh i saw again referencing i believe it was dungeon magazine and i will reference them a bit more but being attacked by a bunch of rust methods especially if you have a heavily armored party and they're just going to sit there and shred through the party's armor rust monsters yeah rust monsters yes yeah okay you said rust methods and it oh, yeah, had me sorry. a little confused nope sorry rust monsters yes you have oozes so a gray slime or a black pudding or a gelatinous cube or multiple constructs so something like a helmed horror or animated statues or golems You could also do it to introduce sort of a a non-combat threat. So the chamber begins to fill with sand or mud or acidic goo or raw sewage. And you could pair, if you would go in with the raw sewage, say you're up under the city in the sewers of the city. And you open a floodgate to a cistern and a whole bunch of raw sewage comes out. And Otiug might come out with it. So now you're fighting an Otiug in waist-deep raw sewage. Yum. Delicious. I can't do uh, spiders, but you can do waist deep raw sewage. I see how it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have no problem with spiders. <laughs> no, again, you don't want to traumatize your table. I agree. But again, if you can give them just a little bit of a shiver, that's okay. And again, as we've stated many times, don't be a dick at the table. If you need in the topic button, that's a great thing to have. Know your party, know your party members. Do be mindful. Don't be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and the last variant that I had for this would be going through a tomb and having sarcophagi propped up against the wall. And so if you step on the pressure plate, the sarcophagi pop open. And so now you have mummies or vampires.
vampires <laughs> coming out and you have to deal with that. I love it. Or you can just have an army of scarabs because, oh my God, those scarabs were amazing in that movie. I'm like on a mummy kick today. I don't understand fully why, but we need those burrowing scarabs as an actual D&D monster. The ones that like crawled up under the skin. There was a monster at one point, a type of scarab that actually did that. And it hasn't come into fifth edition. We need to port that one over. Mainly because it has a save or die mechanic. Well, I mean, if it's crawling up under your skin and your brain, I could see that. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, no, that those freaked me out so much when I was younger. I loved those things. And I can totally see that these mummies would be enclosed in their sarcophagus with a scarab swarm. So, you know, you have four sarcophagi that flop open and these four scarab swarms spill out and then the four mummies pull themselves out of the sarcophagi. Right. So now, depending on the size of your party, you may need that many moving parts in order to provide an actual challenge to your party the other way to do it that would be kind of fun is that they're actually encased within the mummy so you slay the mummy the mummy falls apart as the mummy oh yeah out after that and again that gives a little second burst to go as well yeah you think you're done and then you're not done all right (laughs) so let's go ahead and move on to our second one i guess okay my second one this is my wilderness trap and it is the ring of toadstools this one actually made it into our hag adventure module that we did two years ago now for halloween halloween 2020 so while passing through the forest you come across a strange ring of pale blue mushrooms 10 feet in diameter growing in the middle of the trail you are following on closer inspection they appear to give off a faint blue glow which in the dark has spread to the center of the ring as well. They give off an alluring, almost sweet aroma, drawing you closer with curiosity. I want to look it. <laughs> so <laughs> this is one that you could use it in like a cave, if you have like a loamy sort of cave. Yeah. But it's intended to be used outdoors in like a forest or a swamp sort of environment. I can see that, yeah. So what you do is you give your party the option of either passing through the ring or going through some difficult terrain to go around it. So, you know, if you're in the forest, you surround it with a bunch of brambles and such, and you have to you either hack your way through or backtrack a ways to find another path to go around. Or if you're in a swamp, you might have to step off the path into the actual muck and water of the swamp and wade around it. Or you can just risk it and try and pass through it. This trap is lightly magical if you look at the mushrooms with a detect magic spell they are faintly magical and emanate an aura of enchantment and if you focus long enough it is specifically the sleep spell so you have to succeed on a dc 13 dex check to pass through the circle of mushrooms carefully enough not to disturb the mushrooms if you disturb them they release their spores which triggers a dc 15 con save versus the sleep spell and the creatures that save versus the sleep effect are instead disoriented for one round. Mechanically, they're poisoned, so they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. And disoriented creatures make their con saves versus the sleep effect with disadvantage while they're disoriented. Because you're already starting to feel the effects of the spores... So it's going to be harder for you to resist falling asleep. No, I like that. I may have asked you this before. I can't remember. Maybe when we did our our hag episode, but have you ever seen or stepped on a puffball mushroom? Absolutely. Yeah, I love those things. They're great. So if you've not seen these things before, they're about the size of a baseball or a softball, depending on how large they've gotten. And if you step on these things, they do poof up. And I'm taller and I was younger when I seen them, but those spores still came up, I don't know, hip chest level. And I mean, it's oh, yeah. just this cloud of, so yeah, definitely hitting through and hitting some puffball mushrooms or something like that, just having spores release. Definitely something that happens. That is a good, solid biological trap. Again, if you're making a choice, whether that's something that's been planted In this case, I believe the mushrooms were planted by the hag specifically. They're used as a hunting trap for myconids. There we go, yes. Because myconids being mushroom people are immune to the spores. Exactly, that is correct. But at this point, you choose what seems to be a safe, stable path with a possible, uh, how bad can mushrooms be? Or, you know, if you have dangerous or difficult terrain, that's going to slow your movement speed. There could be something like an ambush. There could be a giant crocodile or one of those giant horrible frog monster things. Or myconids. Or myconids, yeah, because, you know, why not? Because they're there doing myconid stuff. At yeah. a hunting trap, imagine that. That works out really well. And again, it's not a super complex trap, but it has a lot of layers to it, which is really nice. And so one of the things that I put into it is if you're real careful and just sort of step across 
and you succeed on that DC 13 dex check to make sure you don't stir anything up, you don't touch any of the mushrooms as you're passing through, you're fine. If you decide, I'm going to get a run and go and jump over this, (laughs) and you fail to make it all the way across... Looks like those Duke boys are in trouble again. (laughs) When you land, because it does specifically say that these glowing spores are within the circle and ostensibly extend a little ways beyond it as well if when you land you stir up a cloud of spores so starting from your square and emanating for 10 feet in all directions the spores get puffed up for a round so everyone in that area immediately has to make a save yeah. so you could decide to get a run and go and jump and put your entire party to sleep night night <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I did also put in here that if you were really careful, you could harvest the mushrooms for the spores. So each individual cap takes a DC 18 check, whether it's a dex check or using sleight of hand or proficiency with like alchemist tools or herbalist tools or some such is a DC 18 check to harvest the cap without setting off the spores. And whenever you collect all of these spores, they function as the sleep spell. And it has a stacking effect where the number of caps you have in your container is how many D8 worth of hit points the sleep effect affects whenever you set it off. Nice. I like it. So if you're able to spend a little bit of time and harvest the entire circle, you might get 20 caps off of this. So you have this repurposed potion bottle with 20 D8 worth of sleepy time in it. And so whenever you get to that cave full of goblins, you start off by chucking this vial of spores in there and you put 20 d8 worth of goblins to sleep before you even enter the room that sounds like a lot of fun the other thing i could see is like if your party's looking for like some town mechanics to do that maybe the local herbalist or merchant or maybe you know if you're what are they the sin traders the sin oh i'm forgetting their names crap from our pocket theory of sin sin maker the sin maker, yeah. If the sin maker sits there, pops up and says, hey, go find these things for me and I'll pay you some good coin. You might go in just trying to harvest some. Because, I mean, as an NPC, I'd probably pay for something that could put 40 goblins to sleep. That's worth something, you know? Yeah. Party goes and just going to find some good old natural trouble that way. <laughs> and, of course, I did also put in a way to, quote unquote, disarm the trap. So... The spores are rendered inert by exposure to direct sunlight because they are a fungus and most fungi don't like direct sun. Someone's been playing Plants vs. Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> so if you drop a daylight or sunbeam spell onto this trap, you render all of the spores inert. So you can then pass through it without any issue. Yeah, I'd have the mushroom caps kind of close in on themselves and go dormant, thinking yeah. it's daylight. Yeah, no, that's great. Very well done. So what do you got? So this is the one I unabashedly lifted from Dungeon Magazine 293. They had a lovely article called Dirty Orc Tricks, which they had about 30, 35 different things that orcs could do. That was, again, a really, really fun read. A lot of really good ideas. But this one is my, quote, biological trap. Again, it's simple and insidious both. It's really not complex, but I've got two large orc highwaymen or robbing a family or a merchant wagon as the party approaches to help the victims. They reveal that the party or the quote, quote, victims are also orcs, and then they attack the party as a group. So again, this is kind of like an ambush. It's a trap kind of going in. It depends on how the party is going to go variants the highwaymen can be of other races not necessarily orcs or they can be of mixed races so it could look like orcs are instead of attacking orcs dressed up they could be attacking humans because humans are working with the orcs or elves or whatever for this the dc would be just a roll against the bandits performance check with disadvantage because this would be something these bandits have set up and have been doing for a while this is kind of their shtick and how they lure their victims in and again really simple it kind of goes again what's the motivation are your parties like wanting to help everybody they're obviously obviously going to go in and save these people if they're a bunch of murder hobos they're going to want to go fight the orcs or whoever just because hey there's bad guys i'm going to go beat them up so again it's that simple something that looks one way it's all to draw them in and then you snap the trap that instead of fighting two people you're fighting six yeah i like that and it also adds that element of the natural personal aspect of it where you know party rolls up 
and they decide to go in, you know, let's not use words. Let's talk with our fists. Right. And, you know, you have a party of four or five people and they come in thinking that they're only going to be fighting two people. And they, you know, bring in this initial very large attack. Baby throws off the blanket, pulls out a crossbow. (laughs) Well, those two highwaymen are going to bail and they're going to dash off into the woods. And the rest of them who are in on the act see this happen and they decide that they're going to continue playing the part of the innocent victims and let the party pass because they don't have a death wish. Yeah. So you can turn this from a combat encounter into a social encounter just by circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it depends on how the party rolls, how they react to the issue. If they take the time to look before they charge in. Again, if you've got a younger party or a more experienced party, that brashness happens a lot. Even in your more experienced parties, if they're at the table and they've just kind of, sometimes you just get in a mindset. And for whatever reason, you don't think about danger. You've gone through enough stuff. Nothing can hurt me. I'm fine. And so you just barrel in. And if you do that, this one's going to catch you. But if you take your time and you investigate and kind of look to see what's actually going on, you might be able to catch something. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, no, like I said, it was really simple. It was nice. It carries a lot of flavor to it, a lot of complexity, but not really hard to set up. It doesn't take a lot. It seems very realistic. It would seem like something that you'd actually find possibly in real life or, you know, in human story lore type thing. Yeah, no. Dragon Magazine, if you can take the time and find some of the old issues, they've got just treasure troves of little nuggets like this that you can dig up and just it was a wonderful publication i am sad i found out about it so late it really is i mean it was the way to spread ideas for decades almost you know and it is a lost treasure all right so i think we've got one more piece right that's correct all right so my mage's tower trap this is the one that i have lifted from the traps and treachery book from third edition it's called one last coin Ooh, i like it as you rummage around the mage's room or the dragon's hoard or the royal treasury or some other appropriate location you notice a single platinum coin that you must have overlooked when you pick it up you notice an odd glyph carved into the coin's reverse face Hmm, that's weird only then do you see the small hole the coin was covering but now it's too late the genie's already out of the bottle oh we're summoning some gin (laughs) so the coin or more specifically, the ward carved into the back side of it, kept the hidden container or reservoir beneath it sealed until it was removed. So when you look at the coin with Detect Magic active, it shows an aura of abjuration. If you focus in on it, it will be the banishment spell, with the intensity of the aura corresponding to the power of the creature bound underneath it. I like it. It's ideal for conjuring a creature that is incorporeal, something like a banshee, or something that possesses a form that allows it to pass through small spaces without squeezing. So like the air form of the air elemental, or the fire form of the fire elemental, or the water form of the water elemental. Or, you know, an Efreet, a genie, or a Marid. This could also be functionally attached to the stopper of the legendary item, the Iron Flask, potentially releasing any creature not native to the plane of existence the party is currently on, because that's what the Iron Flask is capable of doing, is you can target any non-native creature to the plane that you're on, you open it and you activate it, and they have to make a save or get trapped in the bottle. And they're stuck in the bottle until you remove the stopper and release them. Infinite cosmic power and itty bitty living space. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it really is. And this is an old item. I've got an AD&D first edition adventure module that actually has this item present in it. Oh, very nice. Yeah, I was going to say, this does sound a bit like Aladdin's yeah. lamp, and this definitely has the feel of the older editions. But yeah, you could have something like a Pit Fiend, or a Goristro, or a Baylor, or a Diva, or any sort of very large very powerful creature or even a medium-sized what about a lionel that'd be fun oh yeah 
You could, you could put a gardenal in this thing. Oh my, they'd be so angry. <laughs> oh, and that's what you're banking on is that yeah. whatever is released is so pissed off about having been trapped in there that they are going to tear into whatever they find. Or in the case of something like a genie, it could be something that was trapped and bound here. And so it is fulfilling its obligation. Its, its obligation is when you are released, you are to attack whatever released you, and then your obligation is complete. Yeah, that is a perfectly easy way to set that up. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful way to do that. So it's a great way to have this sort of surprise encounter, especially at high levels, because, you know, you're going through and it's, I mean, it's a coin. You're going to pick it up. Of course. Yeah, you got to. And you can further make it look like something that is not out of place by making it part of sort of a menagerie a collection of various expensive looking art items so you have old crowns and golden ivory statues and crystals and jewelry and all of those sorts of things especially if you're in like a mage's tower for like an archmage that you know a very powerful wizard or a dragon or a prominent noble or a prominent merchant who's going to have money and be able to collect a little eccentric things to put into a collection like this. So you can do this to sort of assuage your party's suspicions. You know, it's just a bunch of knickknacks, really. And it's a platinum coin. Everyone wants a platinum coin. Yeah, exactly. So you pick it up and then you let the genie out of the bottle. Quite literally. No, I love that. This reminds me when I was in high school and I played football, you know, me and some of the football players that might have been dicks at time because, you know, we were young and dumb and we may have been dicks at time. But that was an ongoing kind of gag that we do with each other. Is you Summon take a, genies? Kind of. You take a quarter and you put some super glue on the back and you'd glue it to the concrete outside of where the gym and the locker rooms and stuff were. And then if somebody went to try to pick it up, it'd be stuck. And as they're trying to pick this up, you'd generally go and like smack them in the back of the head. Or if you're like icing a knee or an ankle or something, you go and just dump ice down their back. So again, it's kind of has that feel to it. Like I said, may have been a little bit of a jerk when I was younger happens, but it kind of has that feel of, Oh, look, a coin. Oh crap. You know, that, that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> and that's the wonderful thing is it is infinitely scalable. Yes. Because if you need it to affect a higher level party, you just have a higher CR creature come out. One Tarasque. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, if you could get the Tarasque to a plane of existence other than the material plane, and then you were to follow it to that plane that you banished it to, you could then use the Iron Flask on it and then bring it back you would need two wish spells yeah because i don't think you can it's been a long time since i've looked at the terax stat block so i don't know exactly everything that it's immune to but i know that reflective carapace will deflect a lot of spells i'm just throwing this out there the terax is coming up and some fun stuff we're working on so be prepared because we've got one coming up <laughs> we do indeed so for my third one my this is my magical trap in my mage tower again the trigger is fairly simple. The effects of it are more complex. Personally, I like simple but complex. It works. It kind of mirrors a lot of the things I do. Again, a trap should mirror its makers to various degrees. Simply put, it's a glyph of warding on a staircase. In this case, I have a glyph of warding from the basic rules. The DC for investigation is going to match the wizard's spell save to detect. It's going to be somewhere in the beginning or the middle of a large staircase. Upon stepping on the glyph, it triggers the third level spell sleet storm. Per the basic rules in Sleet Storm, <laughs> the area becomes heavily obscured. Any exposed flames are doused. The area is covered with slick ice, making it difficult terrain. When a creature enters the spell's area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, it must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, it falls prone. So you've got 20 feet that it's going to cover. It's going to turn to ice. It's going to darken any kind of flame or torches the party has to see if for whatever reason, they're one of the few races that do not have dark vision. It's going to limit their vision. It's going to cause them to slip if they fall prone on the stairs. They're going to take fall damage going down the stairs. Because it does cover that 20-foot radius with difficult terrain, difficult terrain reduces your movement by half. So you're going to have to spend at least two turns getting out of this. So that makes it two, possibly three of these dexterity checks that you're going to have to roll to get down these stairs without falling. Well, 20-foot radius... 
means 40 foot 40 diameter. Feet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's so covering that. 40 feet of staircase. Yes. Man, that's nasty. Yeah. So again, this would be like when you're high up and this is the GTFO button. <laughs> And like I said, it's a simple, it's a glyph of boarding. Again, it's not quite a pressure plate. It's very similar, but you hit this and it does like four different things. It does some damage. It hinders your vision. It kills your light. It makes your movement slower. So if there's something maybe up top waiting for you that's a, that has some immunity to ice or spider walk or levitate or something like that, it could just swoop in on your party completely unhindered. Absolutely, yeah. Or, you know, if it is a straight line staircase, having, you know, a couple of spellcasters standing at the top of the staircase chucking spells down the stairs while you're trying to make your way up through this yes there is one other thing sleet storm if a creature has a concentration spell up they have to make a dc save against the spell to keep their concentration spell up as well so it can possibly end concentration spells that you have going on as well so if you've got a mage with what is it divine armor um, mage armor is one what's the there's a cleric one shield of faith yeah shield, shield of faith, of faith. Yeah. Shield of Faith is the cleric one. So Mage Armor, Shield of Faith. Uh, Mage Armor is not concentration. Okay. But there's a handful. But there are, of, there's a bunch of concentration spells that, that are very effective for the party. And if you can snuff those, that costs a lot for a party. And especially if the wizard that placed this here is a top tier wizard. So a level 17 plus with 20 intelligence, which they should. Right. The spell save DC on this is going to be a 19. Right. Yeah. So that's a 19 dex to get up the stairs and a 19 con to maintain concentration. That's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. Yeah. So again, it's simple complex this can really 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 slow down your party so i was, I was thinking that i was putting this together i'm like yeah i was thinking grease spell but grease spell is only a 10 foot radius so I'm like i want something a little bigger and so that glyph of warding again base is a third level spell you can upcast it and if you upcast it at a higher level you can put a higher level spell to match the level of the glyph but uh the uh the sleet storm felt like a good fit for me so there it goes <laughs> yeah I like that. Like you said, it's simple, but elegant. Yes. It serves a very specific function and does it extremely well. So those are our traps. Hope we give you some ideas. We hope you kind of take these and use these or take these as inspiration and build some traps of your own. If you come up with a trap, send it to us. Again, we love to hear from you. Our Discord, we'd love to hear your traps to see if you come up with. Maybe give us some great ideas as well. But again, traps are those things that I enjoy seeing on the table. I don't see them near as much as I would like personally. So we thought we'd bring you guys some, some good ideas. They're really fun. You can do a lot with them. A lot of flavor, a lot of different elements you can bring to the table with these. So yeah, uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. If you have any comments, suggestions, or ideas for future episodes, please send us an email under common taste at gmail.com or send us a direct message through our Twitter account at UCT Homebrew. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Undercommon Taste. We're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Undercommon Taste. That's where we put all of our write-ups. So if you want to help support the show financially, please consider coming over there and becoming a patron. We have just put up the write-up for our Orc Schlager that we made with Kate from Of Mice and Men and Monsters last week. It is a fun, for certain values of fun, <laughs> <laughs> drinking game with a little critter or two to go along with it. So we would love to hear what your thoughts are on it. You know, if you use it at your table, how it went. Again, if you came up with traps based off of inspiration from tonight, let us know what they are. And if we get enough, we might do a listener trap show. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Yeah, where we go through and give our feedback on what traps you came up with. That'd be great. No, that would be a lot of fun. We're also on Discord, as James mentioned. You can find a link to our Discord in the show notes. We also have a channel in our Discord specifically for putting your homebrews for workshopping or for feedback if you wanted to do that. So come join our Discord and chat with us because we would love to chat with you. Absolutely. You can find our podcast on whatever podcatcher you use. As always, please give us a rating and review. It's generally a step or two to give us a rating, and this really helps increase our visibility. This lets us reach more people, and it lets us know more of what you guys want to hear about so we can bring content to you. Thanks once more for listening. Stay safe, and we will see you next week. Happy gaming. Thank you for listening to another episode of Undercommon Taste. You can find links to all of our social media accounts, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch, as well as our Patreon and Discord channel in the show notes. Our theme song is Massacre Anne, written and performed by Mary Crowell and used with permission. 
You can find more of her work at marycrowell.bandcamp.com or on Patreon at patreon.com slash drmaryccrowell. Our logo was illustrated by David Sutherland. You can find him on Instagram at willx underscore 73 or on DeviantArt at deviantart.com slash David Sutherland. Thanks again for listening. Stay safe. We'll see you again next week.